I'm Robert Cavuto, and today on Sonic Perspectives, we are speaking with Rock and Roll Hall of Famer and legend Rob Halford of Judas Priest to talk about his latest book, Biblical. It's currently in stores and online. And uh, Robert, congratulations. Awesome book, and it's perfect uh, companion piece to your other book, Confess. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. It's great to be with everybody today. Before I ask a couple of questions about the book, I was hoping I could ask a question about the Rock and Roll Hall performance. Sure. Yes, absolutely. I, I was completely impressed that you guys were able to come together and put aside any differences and perform like professionals and all get together. So kudos to you. And it really speaks volumes to the character and your personality. So I have to say that's fantastic. Is that like a British etiquette that you've been instilled since you were young that you, you know, you make it work because so many American bands can't seem to get it right. Well, I think there's something to be said about that, the British side of uh, the way we're, uh, we're made as people. But I will say this about the hall, that it, it has a tremendous capacity for um, making you think about the circumstances that you're, that you're in and, and that you're enjoying. And the fact is that um, everyone that you saw performing at the hall had the absolute right, and I believe the need to be there. Yes. It's more about the need more than anything else, you know, because you're trying to celebrate a tremendous achievement that has been bestowed upon you mm -hmm. by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So, yes, you do. You focus on all of the energy and all of the importance and all of the value that's involved in a celebration like that. So to actually be there at long last after wanting and hoping that this would happen for so long was in, in itself a, a tremendous moment for us as a band Judas Priest. But then all of the other important um, elements of what makes Judas Priest the band that's been around for over 50 years now and is still active and, and making great things happen in metal. It all played a part. It all played a part. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we were able to do what I believe was the right thing. Yes. And it was a huge success. And it, it was it was huge for the fans, too. And how was it to play with KK after so many years since he departed the band? Do you know, it's wonderful. I mean, you know, you, you, you hear stories about bands um, that have, again, had their differences and then coming together for special events like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And it's as though it was always there. It was as though the the um, the time element of who we're about and what we do in music ceases to exist. Much like when I returned to Priest after my 10 or 12 year hiatus, mm -hmm. you just carry on, you carry on because the music carries you in the essence of carrying on. It's all about the music. And so when we fired up those classic songs together, it just felt great, you know? It felt complete in the sense of what we were trying to achieve that particular night. And um, and it roared. Do you know, I still have yet to see it. <laughs> People go, have you watched the performance yet? And I'm like, you know, it reminds me of, it reminds me of Maggie Smith from, um, from that great British TV show. Uh, oh, I forget what the name was. But they asked Maggie Smith, like, do, do you watch Do you watch yeah. the performance? And she said, oh, no, I was there. I, I did it, so why should I want to see it again? So th there's a little bit of that. I tell you, it was over so quickly. Uh, that's the, the thing I remember, if anything, was yeah. that it was so fast. It's such, it took such a long time to get to that moment. And the three minutes and change that we had, or a bit longer than that, the eight minutes and change that we had to do the, the job that we had to do was over in a flash. Yeah. And then we were all sitting in the dressing rooms afterwards, having a bite to eat, going, did, did it happen? Was <laughs> it there? You know? And then my highlight with Dolly Parton and meeting all of these other wonderful people that I never knew Pink was a fan and, you know... Um, uh, all of these great, all of these great talent that are out of the world of metal, yeah. but again, prove that met music has no barriers; it has no walls. Sure. We love each other in our music endeavors for various reasons. So it was just a great, great moment for Priest and a great, great moment for rock and roll. And, and congratulations! <clears throat> and I'm so impressed, and I'm I'm honored to be a fan that you guys could do that. So that was wonderful. Now the book, I love the book. I really enjoyed it. I really love the non-linear approach 
that you took to writing this as compared to like an autobiography. But you do take on like the hefty topics of tour buses and lawyers and uh, managers. And, and then you explain your rationales and the importance and how it affected Priest. I thought it was very, very clever and well done. Kudos to that. You. Thank you. Um, my my friend, my good friend, uh, Ian Gittings, was the, the captain of the ship, much as he was on confess i've got this head full of stuff and he's able to bring it out and make sense of it all in in the in the way we communicate the 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 ideas and the stories within uh, both confess and and, and biblical mm -hmm. we, we took the liberty of, of using the holy book as a as a template i just thought that was kind of a little bit of fun you know yeah. you have a you have a book called confess why don't we follow up with biblical and use that that same kind of texture which in its in itself connects to Judas Priest. So we, we are having fun with words, but the content of the book, um, the contents of the book, and the stories that we told, I think, um, it, it, as a, as an idea, as a concept, it worked. It turned out really well. Yeah. When did you realize that you had two books in you? Because it's only about two years apart. I think it was twenty twenty one came out, and twenty twenty two this one came out. Yeah, it's like music, you know. Yeah. Once you once you're full of of, of the ideas for. A, for a project, you 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 grab them quickly, um, and in the time that you're allowed to do so, because of all of the the work that I'm dedicated to do with Priest First, you know. Yeah. But yeah. I, I said to Ian at the back end of the Confess sessions, you know, talking for fifty odd hours in my kitchen <laughs> at my home in England, I said, you know, man, when I'm working with something, all of these other possibilities spring off. Like music, you're writing a song, but while that's being worked on, it gives you an idea for another tune. Right. So I said, you know, got an idea. Don't know what it's going to be called yet, but here's here's the basic premise. And he's like, whenever you're ready, let's go, let's do it. Wow. So it was in the back end of the of the confess uh, sessions. So as soon as we we put the the whole um, confess story to bed, and it had been released to the world, we uh, we got together again to uh, to make biblical. Yeah. What I found the most fascinating about this book was um, the key to your success, particularly in the very beginning of your career. Um, you knew when to leave a band, despite friendships, despite bonds. As a musician, what guided you on these decisions that it would eventually change your life and help you pursue your dream? Yeah, I, th did, I think we I think we uh, basically placed that. That system of of of, of the again, the timeline of events mm -hmm. with, with my departure from Priest. I don't think you can plan for something like that. It is very much an internal part of, of what we are as creative people. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult because obviously you have the right to achieve your own goals in life. But when a lot of those goals have, have been achieved with other people, you have to try and make the balance work and and initially, as the story goes, back in the turbo days, I was telling the guys that I had this real desire just to kind of step out of the, the place that I was and, and do the work that I wanted to to fulfill and had the blessing of the band at that time. And then you fast forward a little bit to when that actually took place and the circumstances of where we were as a band and, and in all of the internal things that were going on. Mm -hmm. um, that's how it worked for me. I don't really think you can say on this day, I'm going to go off and make this album. You, you have to do it from a pure place, yeah. you know, because then I think it's more legitimate rather than going off and fulfilling some wild fantasy that it has to be legit, you know, yep. especially with music because music has to come from an honest place. So uh, we, that's, yeah, we, we do discuss it and we try and give it a little bit more of an insight into how that, that, uh, that all of that occurred. Because being in a band when I was growing up, you had friendships that you didn't leave, want to leave those friendships, but maybe you knew you weren't going to make it with those guys. So that was fascinating. When did you find, when did, what was the moment that you knew that Priest was the right band for you and that it was going to take you out of the vans and into festival stages for 50 years? A lot of it is just that big thing called hope. Wow. A big thing called hope and dreams. Every band that starts has a dream of, of being a big band, that's that's it, you know. It's it's a very normal uh, kind of uh, attitude and drive and part of your motivation. Who doesn't want to have an album in the charts? Who doesn't want to have a, a a song on the radio 
we strive to do that because we want our music to connect with as many people yeah. as possible. So again, you, you're working through the circumstances of the way a band works and, and operates and how you try and go from step to step to step. Um, when, when, when Priest cranked up as a four piece in that little school room that we rented from Father Joe, I knew instinctively then that something was there, you know, it's just like you could feel it in the room that, that the way everything was connecting. Wow. Um, and, and, and the, the, the hope that I had as a singer with the voice was this is the place this voice needs to stay at this, this genre called heavy metal. This mm -hmm. is where the voice is, is going to work best. No, that's great. And you touched upon this in your book that you gave up a lot in your life while you're being a musician, being on tour, being away from home, being away from fam family events. What were some of the hardest things that you had to give up and miss while you were on the road in those 50 years? Do you know, I think it was tougher for some of the other guys that were married and had children. Because to be away from your kids when they're growing up and you're missing them and then you're not yeah. being up, you can't take your kid to school and you can't pick them up from school and you can't see your kid in a play or a performance. I didn't I didn't have that sacrifice, you know. When you're in a band, you have to do those things. I was lucky. I was the I was the the the, the gay guy hidden in the closet. Sure, that was that was a big thing for me to deal yeah. with. But I, I felt I felt that there were bigger issues at hand you know, the, with still within the band in, in everybody's respective families. So for me, I, I, I would definitely say it was a, it was an, easy, an easier set of things to, to go through. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. You know, um, two books in, what was the most useful things that you picked up after reading your books that you learned about yourself? Well, that's a good question. Um. Well, I think a lot of it leads to my sobriety, that the only way I could really make these books happen is to, is the way that being sober has helped me be a more fearless person. And I don't mean that in a in a pompous way. I mean that when you are on this path of, of, of staying clean and sober, you have to be brutally honest in the way you live your life. Mm -hmm. So sitting down and confessing like I did was really opening a channel for all of these other things that were not as explosive as some of the moments in confess but it just opens the opens the gates and um and in this world of you know not being an author i would never call myself that but to have two books out especially in this part of my life yeah <laughs> in my 70 second 77 77 i'm saying 77 because i spoke to tom allen today and reminded me he was 77 <laughs> 72 <laughs> trips around the sun that's him tom uh, Tom's with us. I'm working on the new album right now. Right. But um, but yeah. So that's what I learned about myself. I learned that whereas before, when I was in that a kind of chemical haze, I wasn't really able to see who I was a, as a person because it was being it was being numbed and it was being subdued. All of that was kind of uh, lifted. So th that's one thing I, I, I'm just very grateful and feel blessed for. <clears throat> you don't think you would have been able to write two books? If you were still, if you were not sober, right? Yeesh, no. <laughs> no. No, and I think if I did attempt to do that, I think that they would have turned out a hell of a lot differently, especially Confess. Yeah. Um, Confess would have just been a, probably called blackouts, you know, because that's what some <laughs> of us, that's some of us, what some of us went through. You woke yeah. up the next day, you didn't know where you were, who you were and what you've been through. And you have to laugh. You have to laugh at these things. You, you're not being flippant. No. You, 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 you've got to, you, you, you feel humor towards it because you're so grateful that you got through the whole series of, of, of disasters and, and so on and so forth um, and challenges in, in life. So um, that's, that's, that's what I learned. I just learned that, you know, by the grace of God, I'm still here and that I can just be more realistic. No, that's great. That's very insightful. You know, when I was in a cover band, um, playing in clubs and bars in, in New Jersey, um, we always judge the singer by his ability to go from singing you to Bruce Dickinson, to Ronnie James Dio, to David Lee Roth from song to song. And that must've been difficult for him. And I don't think I realized how difficult it was, but um, back in the early days, who were you channeling uh, to find your voice, to find your sound, to find your place as a singer? Well, of course, uh, as I became a professional musician, 
there really weren't that many heavy metal singers around. I mean, Ozzy was really? there. Right. Um, I, I think I think that as I've said before, two of my two of my great um, singers that I always look, look to and listen to were Ian Gillan from Deep mm -hmm. Purple right. and uh, Robert Plant. Um, Robert, because he did all that screaming and wailing from a blues source, but it showed you, man, my God, what? How is he doing that? You know, he's going into these ex extreme, extreme places. Uh, so he was a great mentor, and 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 to a great extent, um, uh, Ian Gillan as well. You know, some some um, Roger Daltrey, obviously, um, some of the ladies like the great early blues singers, like Bessie Smith, for example. Um, you know, strange, strange, not, not strange names, Edith Piaf. Why would you say Edith Piaf? Yeah. Just because her voice, my God, is just so, so incredibly pure. Um, on the, on the more showbiz side of things, because I, you know, I think even now, even now women are in a better place in rock, in rock and roll and metal, if I'm yeah. using the same, using the right words without being cancelled. But, um, uh, so, but back in the day, a lot of ladies were marginalised, you know, because of that you're a chick. You know, chicks don't make it right. in in rock and roll. So uh, Janis Joplin, you know, a great example. She was one of the groundbreakers. Mama Cass, you know, these are these are grand groundbreaking people. Um, uh, Jefferson Airplane, Grace Slick, yes. you know. So yes. all these incredible women. Um, again, at the, at the forefront of, of rock and, and some hard rock before yeah. metal became established. I listened to all of those people. Right, right. That's great. You know, I, I read a lot of books um, and a lot of autobiographies of musicians growing up in um, England, and they talk about the working man club. I have no concept of what a working man club is living okay. in New Jersey. Is it just guys drinking beer that get off of the job and they drink, or is it, are there women in this club? Is it well, no, it, 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 yeah, it, in, in the UK, even now we have these, I don't know whether they're called working men's clubs any, anymore. It was, a, it, was a ma it was a male domain because back in the day, okay. that was the way life worked in, on, in the British system of employment, you know. Um, but it was, a, a working men's clubs, it was open to everybody. If you didn't get little kids in there. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of a... Of an, of a of, of, of an American uh, example of, of something similar. You know, these great places where veterans get together. What is the yes. name of those, Rob? Oh, VA, uh, VFW halls. Yes. It's a little bit like that, without, possibly without the music, in, in the way oh. that people come together. Oh. And they just talk and they drink. And, and it's just, you know, it's just guys relating to each other on at various, various levels. So oh, that that's sense. what the working men's clubs were. But they were... Hardcore. It's like, it's like, you know, some of my friends who were comedians and they they used to, they, they say that some of the worst jobs in their lives turned out to be the best because you really had to work hard to get people's attention, yes. you know, and yeah, okay. those working men's clubs. You, you'd play the first chord and the guy would pull the plug out and say you're too oh. loud. <laughs> so. Awesome. So the band that refused to turn down said, we'll pay us and we'll leave, that kind of thing. So uh, these are all stepping stones. Right, right. How do, you, how, do you do, how do you walk on stage with people that don't know who you are, have absolutely no interest in you right. whatsoever, but somehow you've got to engage them? What have you got to do to make that work? And we talk about that in biblical. Yeah, that's tough. That is very tough. Um, how about your spirituality? When did you become spiritual? And is there a connection to your latter albums with a spiritual connection to the music and the lyrics? Well, I think we've I think we've all got that in this anyway. It's just <laughs> it's just how we how we discover it and how we utilize it. And when you do discover it, you realize what an important, valuable part of, of, of that of that part of you inside of you is, because you're able to figure out things a lot not easier mm -hmm. but your 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 understanding gets a little bit more clear you know and especially dealing with not on your own life but in the way that you connect with other people um it, it's always there uh, but 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 so me for me as a little kid i was i was brought up not in that type of environment but it was there yeah um 
and I think it's also it's a part of maturing as you get as you get older you start to think more like you look at the sky and you go what's out there all of these yeah. things t- 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 tend to tumble around in your brain but without a doubt uh, th- when I became sober on the 6th of January 1986 that's when I really found that foundation stone for me which is part of the one day at, at a time exercise which is finding some kind of spiritual thing and it doesn't have to be an old guy in a, <laughs> with, with a beard <laughs> sitting on a chair. <laughs> it can be anything, you know, it can be a plant, it can be a rock, it can be a dog, it can be anything. It's you, it's the focus. You put the focus on the spiritual side of whatever that might be. And it's it's really, really important and valuable to you when you discover it. Oh, great. That's a great and very insightful. I, I really love the stories about you and your routine when you're going to write songs at, at Glenn's house where you'd make yourself a grilled cheese sandwich, you wrap it up in tinfoil, <laughs> you head out the door, and then you set out nine pieces of paper with the lyrics, with the titles of the lyrics, and then you walk at work on that. And I was like, that is so fascinating. Uh, and, I, and then to say that there's always a good trying, triumphing over evil in, in most of the pre-songs, which now I have to go back and listen to them with a different ear because, you know, I know the melody, the riffs and all that. So now I have to listen to it with a different ear. I didn't realize that about you, that that was part of, is that a spiritual connection? The good triumphing over evil? I think all of us like that idea. <laughs> Look at what's happening in the Ukraine. You know, we're surrounded by that battle all the time. As we're talking now, the horrible thing that happened in, in California the other day. Um, there's always this thing going on. There's always this turmoil. And I, I think that it's a topic that you can readdress as we have been doing in priests for many, many, many years and, and find a new, find a new angle, yeah. you know? So whether it's the, sin, whether it's the sinner or, or, or whether it's waiting for lightning to strike or firepower or, or some of the new songs that we have, um, that's a great, place to start at for once for one set of song ideas yeah. um the thing about i love about priests is that we we never put ourselves in a box i've always said one minute we can be the painkiller and the next minute we can be living after midnight or be your turbo lover that's what i i love about this band the the, the far reach of, of the of the things that we we attempt to do but if i could take my iPad into my writing room because I'm in Phoenix at the moment. You would yeah. still see <laughs> nine blank sheets of paper. Oh, that's awesome! Because I've got terrible writer's block at the moment. I'm like every day trying to crank up that that idea. I mean, it. it I, I guess you, with your work as, as a writer, as a journalist, you must sit at your laptop and you go, oh, "God, where do I start?" You know. What's the first word I'm going to use to start this story? I'll tell you something I saw the other day, which was a great, a great uh, inspiration. I've yet to put it into practice. Um, I saw a great story, um, an old piece of footage with Sylvester Stallone. And the guy was talking about, because he came from nothing. Yeah. The guy's, the guy's amazing. Yeah. Sylvester Stallone came from nothing. And the guy said, you know, with the Rocky stories, how did you write the screenplay? He goes, I just write, he goes, I write and I write and I write, and 90% of it is rubbish. Wow. He said, but it's, you have to put, you have to break through this mindset of I've, I've got nothing, just start. Start and write about this possibly, this episode, that episode. You look back at it the next day and you go, that's rubbish, that's rubbish, that's rubbish, that's good. And then you go back again and you do the same again, you do the same again, you do the same again. So it's, it's much the same way for me as a lyricist, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and again, in biblical, we, we take you through the process. So I'm doing a lot of the lyrics here in in uh, in Phoenix as we're talking. And so I kind of miss making my schoolboy lo- my schoolboy lunch, <laughs> getting on the motorway and going to Glens. You know, um, things change for for various reasons. Um, but um, yeah, it's like a it's like a being in a bit of a. a a bit of a turmoil of, of getting the stuff that's in here waiting to get out and it'll happen the thing oh, okay. the thing about creative people is that you can't rush things you cannot rush if you rush them and you accept them the chances are the job isn't at, uh, isn't at its peak or isn't at its best you know so slow and steady yeah okay. slow and steady 
Yeah, no. Could you give us an update? I know you you said you're working on lyrics. Is is all the music recorded? And yeah, it's all it's all done. <laughs> wow. Waiting for me. I said this like weeks ago. It's still waiting for me, and um, it is what it is. You know, uh, nineteen studio albums in, I think, and hundreds of songs, and just trying to get that spark. I've got all the titles down, and which is always a great kickoff point. Yeah. I look at the titles and I go, okay, I see that title and all these words are tumbling around me. I look at that title. I'm just going to make them all happen in a cohesive, constructive, important, entertaining way right, right. and make them part of this great treasure trail that Priest has done over the decades, you know. And that's, again, me being me, just getting wanting to get the, the best of everything from all of us in priest don't rush it take your time and, and, the, and then the best things will happen and the fans will appreciate that and i think you always do a tremendous job on oh that. the fans want it now the fans want it now i go on my instagram where's the album so, <laughs> give me a break. i haven't made my grilled cheese sandwich yet <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what you need to kick it off and go for um, a you know it's a great idea Get, today, walk out of the house, straight into the kitchen. Sandwich, yeah. sit in the park, and then you're, you're still <laughs> you know, I, I love Priest, and I've been a fan since I heard Victim of Changes on the college radio station. But when it's all said and done, what sort of legacy do you want to leave behind from in metal with uh, with Judas Priest? The fact that we've been here for such a long time, so so committed and ded dedicated and motivated and full of passion and energy and ideas, and We've never lost sight of that, you know. We, yeah. We've always stayed. We've stayed the course, and um, uh, music is a beautiful thing because it, it it it's being right now somewhere in the world. Somebody's listening to Priest, and I love that. I'm not just talk. So let's not just talk exclusively about Priest. Let's talk about every band that's made a record, every person that's written a song, right. and that's out there in, in the public domain. It's just beautiful, man. You know, so. I think the legacy is that we've left a lot of stuff. We're leaving a lot of stuff uh, for, for people to enjoy, to be inspired by, to be uplifted with, and to be creative with in their own sense. No, that's great. Rob, I, I want to thank you. It's always an honor to speak with you, and I can't thank you enough for taking the time to speak with me today. It, it was fascinating and very insightful, and I love the book. And what, what did you call grilled cheese? What do you call a grilled cheese in England? It wasn't grilled. I had to look it up. Oh, uh, oh, is it a toasty? Toasty. Is it a toasty? A toasty. Yeah. Yes. I had yeah. to go look okay. that up. I, I said, what's what a toasty? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything that's got something in the middle, it's got toasted bread either side is a toasty. Oh, okay. So there you go. <laughs> so I had to look that up. So I said, said grilled cheese. I was like, oh, grilled cheese. That's good. Yeah, show. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rob, thank you. Thank you so much for the time today. Awesome interview. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, my friend. All the Have best. Bye-bye now. Have Bye. a great day. Bye-bye.